Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. to the Virgin Most Powerful Apologetics Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda, your host, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you to talk about how to explain, defend the faith with clarity and charity and confidence. And, uh, you know, usually on this show, we throw down lots of practical ideas about explaining the faith. We share stories. We hear uh, experts come on and dive into, uh, you know, all these various doctrines that people today uh will dismiss and uh, we've, we've done a lot of work had a lot of great guests but one thing that i really love and enjoy uh, uh, is uh listening to conversion stories you know those who want to defend the faith uh conversion stories are so so important because it gives you an inside seat as to how people view the church from outside you can learn a lot uh, about their uh, stories, you know, about their uh, former denominations, about their former worldviews. And through that, it helps us to communicate the faith more effectively. And so you know, one website, by the way, uh, which is incredibly important, I think every apologist ought to have bookmarked on their uh, their homepage, is the Coming Home Network. I think it's chnetwork.org uh, website. That's the... the um, Coming Home International Group, uh, they're the ones that put on Marcus Grodi's, uh, 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 um, oh boy, I just forgot the name of his show, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, Journey Home, right, from EWTN. Uh, I, although I can't remember the name, I watch it all the time. In fact, I was just watching a couple of videos right before the show. Check it out, folks. Uh, great resource. And uh, the reason I bring this up, is because our guest today is going to share her journey of faith. And her journey of faith is from Judaism to Catholicism. Her name's Debbie Herbeck. You might be familiar with her with Renewal Ministries. Debbie's going to come into the dojo, and she's going to share with her us her journey of how uh, you know someone who brought up in a Jewish household eventually became uh, convinced that Jesus the Messiah and followed him. So uh, I, I love conversion stories, and especially uh, one remarkable thing that I've noticed with conversion stories, uh, people who come into the faith through Islam or Judaism, is there almost always is some sort of extraordinary gift by God that's given them. So we look forward to hearing about Debbie's story. That's going to come on the other side of the first break. And on this side of the first break, we're going to do our uh, Finding the Fallacy for today. Since it's Friday, we usually do a propaganda uh, technique. And this one's one of my favorites. In fact, I'm going to revisit it. I have talked to about it before, but it is so pervasive out there. It's called Defining Opposition Out of Existence. And also our Meet the Early Church Father today is a great. He is Basil the Great. So we're going to learn a little bit about Basil the Great and uh, look at this propaganda technique for our Finding the Fallacy today. But first, uh, it's a couple of important housekeeping details. You are part of the show. So especially when Debbie comes on the show, give us a call if you have a question or a comment. Love to hear from you. Our phone number is 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or you can always email your questions or comments. Of course, I, I can't look at them during the show, but we definitely uh, will bring them up on the show, maybe in a future broadcast. And you email your, your comments to email, uh, which is basically questions at handsonapologetics.com. Questions at handsonapologetics.com. And so, you know, thank you so much for tuning in, listening to the program. I appreciate it. And uh, I was just looking at the chat room, and I see a couple people are going to stay on for the show. So welcome. So it's time for our shout-outs. To hello to everybody watching on social media, live stream, Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Great to see you. Yes, the explosion of emojis. Love it. Uh, 
Uh, great stuff, folks. And, of course, thank you. And uh, for those listening on podcast, we also welcome you. And, uh, you know, I should also mention, as I usually do, that uh, maybe you can't catch the whole show. Maybe you'll get a, a part of it. Or maybe you'll hear that one of your favorite speakers is with a guest. And you, you would love to listen to the program, but you can't. You can always access all the shows of Hands On Apologetics, in fact, all the programs, the awesome programs put on by Virgin Most Powerful Radio, by going to the website, virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Uh, just go up to our shows and pull it down. You can find Hands On Apologetics, Terry and Jesse, Jesus 911, uh, Bible with the Barbers, and uh, you know Happy Hour, all those great programs at an instant. So that way you can listen to the shows while you're uh, just doing ordinary works, uh, taking out the garbage. Perhaps you're going to be mowing the lawn soon. Hopefully you're not shoveling snow. But uh, anyway, another awesome resource that uh, we have available today. So without further ado, why don't we jump into the Finding the Fallacy. And like I said, today's Friday. We always or try to do a propaganda technique on Friday just to change things up. And this propaganda technique is called defining opposition out of existence. In a sense, what it what it does is that uh, a person will accept only evidence that can't possibly be satisfied. Okay, so by very definition, it's impossible to ever prove your point. And uh, one th- this hit home with me years ago when I was talking to a fundamentalist Protestant about sacred tradition. And they said, show me in the Bible, you know, a sacred tradition. So I, I, I pointed out a few things, you know, where uh, Paul mentions the names of uh, the magicians who uh, contested Moses. And, of course, that's not in the Old Testament. He got that from Jewish tradition. And also in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, where the rock that follows the Jews in the desert, uh, Paul mentions that. But, of course, that's it doesn't say in the Old Testament that it followed him. That's a Jewish tradition. And the person said, no, 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 no. Uh, those are written traditions because they're in the New Testament. Now, what I want you to do is show me an unwritten tradition in Scripture. And I thought about it, and it's like, really what they're asking me to do is to provide an unwritten thing in writing, which, of course, is impossible, right? They have effectively defined opposition out of existence. And this occurs a number of ways in different uh, aspects. For example, uh, you might run into an atheist who will say, show me something purely supernatural in nature. Or, or put another way, they'll say, Show me scientific proof of a purely nat- uh, supernatural cause. And, uh, of course, you can't do that because uh, you can show a supernatural agency. But ultimately, it happens in nature. So, uh, in a sense, they've defined opposition of existence. So, that's our, our propaganda technique. So, just be aware, you know. Always ask yourself whenever somebody throws down the gauntlet and says, Show me X. Think to yourself, is it possible to supply X? All right, so let's move on to our Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is St. Basil the Great, who lived roughly A.D. 330, died January 1st, 379. He is one of the three great Cappadocian fathers. Sometimes you'll hear about the three Cappadocian fathers. That includes Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazius, and uh, Greg of Nyssa. Okay, so two Gregories and a Basil. Uh, Basil was born roughly around the year 330 A.D. in Caesarea uh, in Cappadocia from a very illustrious family. His father uh, was the son of St. Uh, Macrina the Elder, a zealous pupil of St. Gregory the Wonder Worker of ne- uh, Neo-Caesarea. His mother, Emilia, was the daughter of a martyr. So he has two very holy parents, lots of holy pedigree, if you will. And of the ten children of the family, three became bishops, including uh, Basil, who eventually uh, became a bishop. And uh, so, like I said, a wonderful holy family, holy pedigree. And uh, he, uh, it pays off. As a student in Athens, uh, Basil uh, first met his buddy, Gregory of Nanzius, or Nanzianzus, sometimes it's called, uh, joining him in a friendship so close that in his eulogy, to Basil in 381, Gregory uh, said that they were one soul with two bodies. That's how close friends they were. Uh, soon after his baptism, 
Basil, uh, which, by the way, he postponed until his adult years, he sought a more perfect uh, life, and he journeyed to Egypt and inspected all the various ascetical, uh, you know, the monks in the desert. Uh, and finally, uh, upon coming home, he met uh, Eustathius, a Sebastian, uh, who seemed to Basil to have uh, discovered already uh, that for which he had himself been searching for so long. So the history of this friendship with Eustathius, say that three times without stumbling, is rather like the same uh, friendship that Jerome had with Rufinus. Uh, it started off very warm and friendly, almost to the point of uh, just being best buddies. And then eventually uh, there was accusations and counter accusations. Then there's incredibly acrimonious parting of the two, just like uh, with Jerome and Ruf Rufinus. Uh, at the time of the Emperor Velens, uh, Bishop uh, Basil uh, was virtually the only Orthodox in all of the East. You got that, folk? He's basically the only Orthodox in the East during this time. And it was a sheer force of character combined with his courage that he withstood the emperor and uh, sometimes ignored the emperor in order to propagate the true faith. And uh, that's something very important for us to remember as well. You know, often we look at the state of the church today and we feel discouraged. But believe it or not, if you feel discouraged, you need to dive into church history, folks, because... This is nothing compared to what the church has faced in the past. Uh, can you imagine that, uh, I mean, it was said by uh, church historians that during the, the reign of Arius, you know, Arianism, that you could count all the Orthodox bishops on your fingers, and most likely on the fingers of one hand. That's how bad it was. So that's our Meet the Early Church Father for today, Basil the Great. And coming up on the other side break, we're going to talk with Debbie Herbert. So stay tuned, everyone. This is Terry Barber inviting you all the men to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877 877- 526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation... Call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics. Uh, it's great to be with you today. And uh, we're going to talk about a journey to the faith. Uh, uh, this is particularly uh, an area of interest for me because uh, I have a great love for uh, Jewish people and, and trying to understand how uh, you know modern Jews understand Jesus. I understand a lot of uh, uh, people who are out of the faith. Uh, the name Jesus normally isn't even mentioned in a household, a Jewish household. And so it, I mean, it's very good to, to hear a conversion story from that direction because it kind of shines a light, not only for me, but for all of you, you know, trying to, to look at things from outside of the church. And so to help us walk through this journey, uh, we have Debbie Herbeck, who's going to share her journey about, uh, you know, coming into the Catholic Church. And for those who are not familiar with her, uh, for the past 25 years, Debbie has worked extensively in youth and women's ministry, sharing her personal journey of faith from Judaism to Christianity to the Catholic Church. Debbie uh, is the uh, newsletter editor for Renewal Ministries, and she's written several books, including Safety Through the Storm, 120 Reflections on Hope, Firmly on the Rock, 120, 120 Reflections on Faith, and Love Never Fails, 120 Reflections on Love. And also she and her husband Peter co-authored a book called uh, When the Spirit Speaks, Touched by God's Word. Uh, the Herbecks live right here in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, with their four children. So Debbie, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Thank you. It's very good to be with you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm so glad I have you on the show because a while back, um, I met you at my parish church here in Livonia, Michigan, and we have a series of talks called Why Be Catholic, and we have conversion stories, and I was just blown away by your story of coming to the faith. Um, so I'm so glad that you, you agreed to come on the show. So, you know, tell us, where did it start? What was your background? Well, my background was I grew up in a very Jewish home um, in the Chicago area, and um, my grandparents were very, um, very involved with the Jewish community in Chicago. My grandmother was the president of Hadassah, which is um, a very large uh, charitable Jewish charitable organization, and she was president of the Chicago chapter, which um, was one of the largest in the country. And so even before I was born, she and my grandfather were very involved with um, supporting the um, beginnings of the state of Israel. They um, single-handedly raised, you know, a lot of money for the state of Israel and were very, they would go, I remember even after, when I was a kid, they would go once a month to Israel and meet with different leaders um, like Moshe Dayan and, and Golda Meir and Yitzhak Rabin and wow. some of these kind of heroes for Jews, Israeli heroes, or heroes of Israel. And so that was my upbringing, was to be really um, immersed in Jewish culture, Jewish tradition. I had a very strong identity as a Jew um, in a conservative Jewish home, and really was surrounded by Jewish people. Um, besides my own family, our neighbors, our friends, the school that I went to, and so um, I didn't really know that much about Christianity. I didn't really know very much about really who Jesus was and um, the claims of Christianity. It also was very, very insulated, and I had a very strong personal identity as a Jew. Right. Now, uh, was there an animus against uh, Jesus or Christianity in your home, or was it just uh, kind of the unknown? It just never was brought it up? I think, I mean, obviously, as, as a Jew, I... I was grew up with a lot of understanding of the Holocaust and, and the horrors that happened there. Um, and I don't think it was ever in my home directly related to this is what the Christians did to us. But there was clearly a message that um, in order to remain strong in our Jewish identity um, and strong as a Jewish people, we needed to be somewhat separate and distinct from the Gentile world. In other words, don't marry a Gentile um, and so I grew up with the, the message was very clear that um, Jews are intended to be somewhat separate from, from the Gentile world. And for me, that really meant that I didn't have a lot of information about Christianity. It wasn't, um, I didn't have a lot of hostility toward it. I just really didn't know that much about it. And I, it was clear to me that that wasn't something that I should be or could be interested in knowing more about. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so what's the next step in the story? I mean, uh, when did the first uh, 
uh, your first, uh, uh, what do I want to say, encounter with Christians or, you know, mm, yes. coming in contact with Christians. How did that come about? Well, I, th- I think um, what I want to say kind of more about my relationship with God is I didn't even know that that was possible. I, even though I grew up in a strong Jewish home and went to a synagogue and was bat mitzvahed um, and had a lot of um, religious education, God was not relevant in my life, so I thought he didn't seem personal or real or even um, that it was something attainable. And so um, I think I lived, even though I had all the cultural understanding of what it meant to be a Jew, I lived like many secular Jews do today, which is that um, we're on our own, you know, and we've been put on this earth to have a good life and to be successful, but God isn't really intimately involved with us in a day-to-day way. And no. so, it, okay. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say. Now you mentioned you uh, raised a conservative Jew. Uh, you know, I think most people, at least in Catholic minds, they think of the Hasidic Judaism, which or Orthodox. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- w- was that part of being a conservative Jew? Like, what's the difference between those? Yeah, um, good question. There's really like um, conservative Jews are not Orthodox or Hasidic Jews, so. Across the spectrum, I guess you'd have um, more. You'd have reformed Jews who tend to be more liberal, um, more secularized Jews, and then you have conservative Jews who tend to be kind of in the middle. So they're not um, they're not as extreme in terms of their uh, observance of things um, as Hasidic Jews would be or Orthodox Jews would be. Um, and and you usually know when you see it. Uh, Orthodox or a Hasidic Jew because they dress differently and they have a different, you know, lifestyle and approach to family and all that. Conservative Jews just blend right in with the the people around them, but they're very, you know they're faithful and going to synagogue and religious upbringing of their children. Uh, my grandparents kept kosher, and so um, so conservative Judaism is not to the extreme, you know left right. in terms of, or not extremely, extremely Jewish, like a Hasidic Jew would be, if that, if that helps or makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so would, uh, like, a relationship with God, w- would that be something that would be emphasized amongst conservative Judaism, or is... Not that, really. Not okay. that, not in my upbringing at all. It's more like, you know, you got bat mitzvah, you did your religious education, you had your religious upbringing, you celebrated all the, the holidays and the, and the holy days. And this is clearly your identity. You married a Jew, um, but I we never really talked about personal relationship with God, or that God was real or relevant in our lives, um, or even about eternal things like is there a heaven? Is there punishment for sin? You know, those things were not really on my radar growing up. Right, right. So after your bat mitzvah, you uh, kind of said, okay, well that's. That's it for this religious stuff. Yeah, I think I just kind of moved on with life and got interested in things that, you know, young teenage girls get interested in, boys and, yeah. you know, sports and doing well at school and popularity and, um, you know, those kinds of things. And um, I, th- I think I didn't begin to really think about bigger questions um, until I was in the middle of my sophomore year of high school. I was 15. And... Um, my family was, um, I have an identical twin sister, a brother four years younger, and a brother two years older. And my brother at this time, Mark, was off at college at university his freshman year. And we got a phone call um, saying that he was on his way home from from school for Christmas break and had been in a car accident. And I remember um, receiving the call and... I was with my sister at the time, and we weren't at home with my parents, and so we received a call, and I remember the first thing I did was um, pray, and that was really the first time I had prayed authentically from my heart, um, really directing a prayer to God, and I think a lot of Catholics can relate to this point of knowing a lot of prayers, even knowing a lot by heart and praying them often rotely, but not really feeling like you're connecting or even addressing God as you pray. But this was a very heartfelt prayer, and I just said, God, I don't know if you're real or if you care about me, but if you're there, please save my brother's life. And 
a few minutes after they, I prayed that prayer, we received a call that my brother had died in this car accident. He had been on his way home on a snowy two, two-lane highway and had been run off the road by a semi-truck and was not wearing his seatbelt and was taken by ambulance to a small, very small hospital and really died on a stretcher before um, anyone could even see him and before my parents could get to him. And so I just remember feeling like my response, you know, in that moment, besides anger and tremendous grief was, okay, God, where were you? Why weren't you there for us? Why didn't you hear my prayer? Why aren't you good? Why don't you care? Those kinds of things. And so that was a very, very painful time. We had family that and friends that came to mourn and grieve with us the first few days. It's called Sitting Shiva, and they came to our home with food and um, prayers and all of that. And I remember going around the room and just asking different people in the room, you know, where is God and why does God allow bad things to happen to good people and what happens when we die? And nobody had any answers for me until finally I was pointed to the rabbi who was there. And um, I went and talked to him. And in my mind, he was just this very old man. Um, And I poured out my questions to him, and he looked at me and said nothing. And then he said three words that I'll never forget. He said, I don't know. Mm. I don't know the answers to those questions, but I pray that you find what you're looking for. And, of course, that infuriated me even more because I really needed to know and so the next few years of high school were just um were just really challenging my parents were grieving tremendously didn't have the resources emotional resources to help us understand it and to grieve properly and so it was just really um a rough road a lot of you know spending the, the week studying very hard so i could get into a good university and and be able to leave home And then on the weekends, you know, doing a lot of things as a teenager to help me forget the deep pain that I was going through, you know, partying and um, different things. And so um, I was it was a very confusing time for me and a time when I was just very eager to be away from home and to begin my life away from the sadness and the grief and the the lack of answers um, in my home and around me. Yeah, I I can't even imagine. I mean, uh, what kind of impact that would have? Uh, well, we're coming up on our for our break, so uh, well, on the other side, let's talk about uh, you know, you going to college and what happens there. We're talking with Debbie Herbeck, and she's sharing her journey of faith from Judaism to Christianity to Catholicism. Stay tuned, everybody. More to come. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. 
please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Buddy, we're chatting with uh, Debbie Herbeck is t- talking about her amazing uh, journey of faith into Christianity and into Catholicism. As uh, Grew up in a conservative Jewish household, and uh, it was really the tragedy of uh, your death of your brother that uh, asked, kind of provoked you to ask the big questions and uh, you were just saying right before we came to the break that uh, it, that you wanted to more or less uh, run away from, you know, the the grief that was in your household and, and go away to college. So t- tell us what happened at college. Well, I um, began to apply to colleges, and I just really felt drawn to the University of Michigan, and I didn't really know why. It's a big university. I didn't know anybody going there. I was rather shy. And um, I got into the school, and my sister, my identical twin, didn't. So for the first time in our life, we were going our separate ways, which was very scary. Huh. Um, but I, I was excited to go and to meet other. I knew there were a lot of other Jewish kids at the University of Michigan. And um, so my parents drove me up and dropped me off, and I um, went up to my room. I wasn't rooming with anybody I knew, and I could tell that she wasn't Christian, she wasn't Jewish just from her name. And Mm -hmm. so um, I got into the room, and she had already been there for 24 hours because she was from Michigan, and and her room was all set up. And I remember going over to her side of the room and just making some light conversation. And she had a picture on her dresser, an 8 by 10 framed picture, not a photo, but a picture of a guy with um, long brown hair and a beard and brown eyes. And this was in, you know, the mid-70s. And I remember asking her if that was her boyfriend. And um, it was actually a picture of Jesus. It was one of those kind of (laughs) contemporary-looking pictures of Jesus. Yeah. And I think she was a little bit surprised, um, but she and she said, you don't know who that is. And I said, well, I, no, I'm not really sure. I don't think so. And she said, well, his name is Jesus. And, and then she said, and he is my boyfriend or something kind of strange like that. Hmm. And so um, I think, you know, what I found out about my roommate, Lori, was found out later was that she was a Catholic who had been invited her senior year of high school to a Life in the Spirit seminar class. And had really met the Lord and fallen in love with Jesus and really had come to the University of Michigan to really seriously live out her faith as a Catholic. Mm. And so here I was, my first time away from home um, in a small dorm room with my first Christian. Um, And Lori did a pretty good job of not, you know, kind of badgering me about her beliefs. Um, But there was another girl who lived on our floor and her name was Sarah and she was what I would call a Jesus freak. She just kind of walked, talked, and breathed her faith. She played guitar. She would walk around and sing songs about Jesus. And she and I shared nothing in common except we were both athletes. And so we began to go to the gym together and play on intramural sports teams, and we we began a friendship. And Sarah was also a Catholic who had met the Lord. And um, back in those days, I don't think there were a lot of Catholics that had a real clear plan of how they were going to go about evangelizing somebody. And so I don't think Sarah ever sat down and kind of walked me through the gospel message, but she lived her faith every single day. And she was one of the most authentic, joyful people that I had met at the university and someone who, who genuinely did not care in a good way what other people thought about her. And so I was definitely drawn to her and drawn to, to who she was, even though I didn't really know 
what or who she believed in. Yeah. And then, yeah, that, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that must have struck you as really odd that, uh, you know, that they're in love with this person that lived 2,000 years ago, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't even really know that much about Jesus. I just knew that they were Christian and they had a very strong set of beliefs. And um, it was really my first exposure to people that believe something differently than I did. I mean, close, you know, more intimate exposure in terms of day-to-day -day living with them. And so... Um, so one day I was taking a great books class and we were studying first and second century literature and the teacher came to class and said, I, you know, I'd like you to read the book of Romans and do, and do write a paper on it. And I went to a master class and said, well, I don't, I don't have that book. I don't have a book called the book of Romans. And he said, it's in the new Testament. And I said, well, I'm not allowed to have one of those, you know, I'm Jewish. And he said, I don't care. Find a New Testament and do the assignment. Hmm. And so I went to my friend Sarah, and she offered to lend me her Bible. Um, she had one of those leather-bound Bibles that had her name embossed on the front of it. Um, and I took, she put a little ribbon in for a place marker where Romans is and said, it's a very difficult book. Um, I'd love, love to help you. And I said, no, thanks. So I took her Bible back to my room and I began to read Romans. And it is a very difficult book. And I had a very hard time, even in the first few paragraphs, deciphering the context of the message and what was happening um, historically and, and, and everything about it. But I was fascinated by this girl who had her own Bible. And not only did she have her own Bible, she read it and then she... and she wrote in it. She underlined it. She wrote in the margin. She wrote on every square inch of that Bible. And what came to me very distinctly as I flipped through her Bible, which was like a personal diary, was that those words were speaking to her. And she was speaking back. And there was a dialogue or a conversation that was going on between the words that were on the page and her soul. And honestly, it scared me a bit because I felt like there's a power at work here that I don't understand. I've always related to the sacred stories that I grew up hearing as just being stories that inspire us to be better people. But here's somebody who actually believes this word has power and its source is coming from God itself. And so I remember just, I don't think I even did the assignment, but kind of gave her her Bible back and felt like, wow, if I hold on to this too long and read it, maybe it would have some power over my life as well. And it wasn't so much later, much, much later, that I came across a passage in the book of Hebrews that describes so well what I was feeling in that moment, and that is the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so I handed her back her two-edged sword and kind of went on my way. But it was a window into her relationship with God and what was the source of strength and life for her. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, it, you know, and still you're kind of like looking from the outside in. And uh, mm -hmm. th that certainly must have felt very peculiar, like you said. I mean, uh, was it attractive at all? There was something attractive about it. I mean, I was definitely, on an intellectual level, I was definitely searching for answers. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know where to find them, and I definitely knew that whatever this Christianity was, it was off limits for me as a Jew. Mm -hmm. um, and so a few months later, probably, you know, it was during Lent, so it was probably March, um, some girls, including this friend Sarah, came to my dorm room and asked, said they were taking a study break and asked me to come down to the lounge to watch a movie that was on TV. And so I went down to the small lounge where there was a TV and everyone was sitting on the floor and I was sitting next to my friend Sarah and the movie comes on um, and I le leaned over to my friend Sarah and just said, what is this? You know, we were whispering, what is this movie? And she was like a little bit evasive about it. And then the title comes on the screen and it's called Jesus of Nazareth. And I was just horrified because I was envisioning my grandfather's reaction, you know. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I stayed as the movie began was because we were in such a small 
um, space, and I was just embarrassed to get up and kind of make a scene and walk out as the movie was starting. So I watched as the movie unfolds, and, and you know, this is the Hollywood version of Jesus' Life, um, the Zeffirelli film. Um, and I'm watching Jesus as he's growing up and going to the synagogue and going to the temple and doing all the things, you know, that are portrayed there in the movie. And at a certain point, I turned to my friend Sarah and I said, he's Jewish. Hmm. And she looked at me like, yeah, of course he's Jewish. And I thought, wow, that's a really, that's a really well-kept secret because I never <laughs> knew that Jesus was a Jew. Um, how did I miss that? You know, he wasn't. I wasn't allowed to know about him, and he wasn't a topic of conversation. And so, so my whole life I had felt this, you know, I had this kind of adverse or at least arm's length approach to Christianity and Jesus. And now I'm watching this movie, and I'm realizing that he's one of us, that we're both Jews. And so as I'm drawn into this movie, I'm drawn into not only the fact that he's Jewish, but there's something about this man that's everything I want to be, that I can't be on my own strength and on my own power. His ability to love everyone, his ability to speak the truth, his ability to um, to not care what others think about him. Um, it was just very, he was very attractive to me. I don't know how to say it. I mean, and I realized this was a Hollywood version, but it was my first exposure to the person of Christ. And so I'm drawn into the story, and then about two hours in, as the, as the program is beginning to wrap up for the night, it was going to be shown in two parts, there's a scene that comes on where Jesus approaches a town called Bethany, and he is met there by a woman who begins to weep. And she says to him, Lord, where were you? If you had been here, our brother would not have died. And I, in that moment, felt like those were, that was a script from my own life. And it was very painful because I thought I cannot sit through another story with a very bad ending. Those are the words I said to God when I reached out to God, and he did not answer my prayer. And my own brother died. And I wanted to get up and run out of the room, and I felt like, honestly, I was being held there by some invisible force. And I watched as Jesus went to the tomb of this of Lazarus, his friend, and I knew Jesus as a Jew shouldn't be at that ritually impure, unclean place. And I watched as Jesus calls forth his friend and raises Lazarus from the dead. And I remember sitting there thinking, who is this guy? Is he the one? In other words, could he be the Messiah? Wow. And well, I just that, sat with that thought for a few minutes. That's, yeah, what a profound moment. We're talking with Debbie Herbeck, and she's sharing her journey to the Catholic faith. Stay tuned, everyone. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back. We are talking with uh, Debbie Herbeck, who is sharing her journey of faith from Judaism to Christianity. And uh, Debbie, you know, it, it, I, what's fascinating about that to me is you can really see the hand of God in at work, you know, God's mm-hmm. providence. Because who uh, you could have done anything, but you ended up in this particular movie. You know, he ended up sitting through the whole thing in that the movie, the first part of the movie would end with su- the same profound question that you asked, you know, not too long ago. Right. No, exactly. It was just, I mean, I didn't see it at the time, but it was definitely rocking my world. And so yeah. I, as I watched that scene unfold, I remember thinking, what if there is a power in this world or beyond this world that's greater than death? And it sparked like this tiny, tiny ray of hope in me. I went back to my room that night, my dorm room, and I couldn't sleep. And I got up and walked down the long hallway to my friend Sarah's room, and I knocked on her door, and I didn't say anything. She opened the door and just put the, her Bible out, extended her Bible to me. And I took it down to my room, and I sat in my beanbag chair, and I opened it up to where the little place marker was, and I began to read the Gospels. And I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I came to the part in John that I had just watched on the movie where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not die, but the one who believes in me will live forever. And I didn't know what a lot of those words meant, but I really sensed there was a promise implicit in those words. And so that night, for the second time in my life, I seriously prayed and I said, God, I don't know who you are or where you are, if you're even real, but if you're there, show me. And if Jesus is the Messiah, give me the faith to believe. And that night, nothing remarkable happened, but I knew that I was on a journey to find truth. Um, Never in my mind was I thinking about converting or leaving my family, I just knew that I needed to find out if this was true or not. And so I went to my friend the next day and gave her her Bible back, and she wisely said, why don't you keep it for a while and begin to read it? And so as the semester wrapped up, I began to read in depth the Gospels. I began to read the Old Testament and the Messianic promises that were there, and I took that Bible home with me that summer, and I read in secret um, late at night with a flashlight, I began to read the words of Jesus and to hear what he tells us about what it means to follow him. And I was afraid and I was shocked because I sensed the high call of what it meant to be a disciple. And um, I was on a journey to find to find out what that truth might be. Yeah, that would be frightening. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right, because uh, in your position, I mean... Uh, that would mean it could the potential end of like everything you've known up to that point, you know, uh, right. The, 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 uh, uh, your family as a cohesive whole, uh, you know, your, your background, your Jewish identity. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh what happened from that point? 
Well, I um, spent the summer at home, and I was really, you know, it was a bit of a fog for me because um, I was reading a lot of things that were very compelling, but I was also living, you know, in my home, and just it was like two, a clash of two worldviews. Um, and so I was constantly back and forth with it all. Um, went back to school in the fall and um, continued to read the scriptures and really was praying that prayer faithfully every single day prayer for revelation of who God was and um, revelation to know if Jesus was the Messiah. And a number of different things happened, which, you know, I don't have time to go into in great detail, but um, I continued my friendship with Sarah and some of the other girls, some of the other Christian girls, and um, continued to just really seek and study after truth. And I was reading things like whoever does not hate father, mother, sister, brother, is not worthy to be my disciple, and and passages about counting the cost. And Mm -hmm. they were hitting home for me because I thought there is a cost here to believe in Jesus. And I was very disturbed that I didn't see some other Christians around me with that same sense of um, cost of discipleship. Um, But I knew that there would be a cost for me. And so I went home for Thanksgiving that that um, November. This is my sophomore year now. And I sat down with my parents. We were in a Chinese restaurant um, having dinner. My sister hadn't come home from college yet. And I just began um, to share with them things I was learning, you know, things I was learning from the Old Testament about the Messianic prophecies and kind of ended our conversation with posing a question to them. Do you did you ever think Jesus might be the Messiah? And as soon as those words came out of my mouth, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> um, my parents were uh, very upset. They uh, whisked me away from the restaurant and brought me home. And um, that my father went into another room and called um, some business associates, some friends, a Catholic couple, over to the house and said, our daughter, we think our daughter might be brainwashed or she might be thinking about converting. Can you talk her her out of it? Hmm. And I'm sorry to say these these folks who are very, you know, nice people, but not very converted Catholics themselves, began to sit with me and say, you're Jewish. You don't need to think about Jesus. You don't need to think about converting. Um, You're going to hurt your family and don't do anything that's going to hurt your family. And so... Um, it was a very telling weekend. It was a weekend of really understanding a little bit, a taste of what the cost would be. My mother was cried, I think, the whole weekend. was clearly very, very upset. My father tried to talk me out of going back to school. And um, in the end, I returned to the University of Michigan. And a few days later, after that weekend, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was standing in a long, dark hallway And I heard a voice call out to me saying, who do you say that I am? Hmm. And in the dream, I couldn't see anybody. And a second time, the voice called out to me, who do you say that I am? And now I could see like the shape or the outline of a person, but I couldn't see their face. And then a third time, who do you say that I am? And as I looked up, I saw standing before me, Jesus. And I said, you're Jesus, you're Jesus. You're Jesus. And then I woke up from my dream and was very clear and very vivid. I was going to the gym to meet my friend Sarah, and I kind of retold the dream and said, do you think there's anything to this? And she kind of laughed and said, yes, of course. You know, God is revealing himself to you. And I said, it's too hard. I understand intellectually who this person Jesus was. I've, you know, read the books. I've done the study, but I don't have the faith in my heart to choose this, knowing that it could cost me so dearly. And she said, keep praying, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking, because that's the kind of prayer that God loves to answer. And so I did that. I continued to pray and to read scripture and to pray that prayer for deeper faith. And probably a week later, I was in my dorm room at night doing my typical time of prayer sitting on my loft and this night there's something particular particularly different it felt different but as I prayed that prayer I experienced this kind of 
presence and light and warmth in the room with me, and I knew in some inexplicable way that God was there with me. I didn't know who he was, but I knew he was there, and I was afraid. Hmm. And I just got down on my knees, and I said, God, I know that I've offended you. I know that I've broken many of your laws, but if you give me another chance, I want to know you, and I want to live for you. And as soon as I prayed that prayer, and I guess in Christian jargon, it would be called like the sinner's prayer. Um, right. Jesus was there with me in the room, and I could see him. And I don't know if it was a vision or I don't know what it was, but I knew he was there, and he was extending his hand to me. And in my heart, not in an audible voice, but in my heart, I heard him saying, this is for you. It's a gift. You did nothing to earn it or deserve it, but this is the gift of faith. And in that moment, I just knew it was true. In all those years of never knowing who he was, in all those months of seeking and searching, in that one moment when he held his hand out to me, I knew that he was the Messiah. I knew that he loved me, that he had a plan for my life, and that he was asking me to follow him. Right. And so I said, yes. I said, this is what I've been searching for and seeking for. I believe that you are the Messiah, and I want to follow you with my whole life. And I know it's going to be difficult when I'm going to trust you for all those hard things that are yet to come. And I want to tell you, my theological understanding was not complete. Yeah. <laughs> it was not even close to complete. Um, but I had a personal encounter with the person of Christ. And that was enough to, to draw me into life with him. And so that night in my dorm room, I said, yes, I'm going to walk with you no matter what. And um, that was not the end. It was really the beginning of my life in Christ. I stayed in Ann Arbor for the summer to really grow more in my faith. My parents ended up, I ended up telling them what I was doing. They ended up hiring a private investigator. They thought I was brainwashed and you know, influenced and were very concerned about me, which I, now as a parent, I totally understand. Um, but it was, there were some very, very difficult years there where um, my parents really distanced themselves from anything about my life that was threatening to them. And so um, sure. it was a big part of my life I couldn't share with anyone in my family. Um, so it was, it was mm -hmm. very difficult, but, but I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that Jesus was calling me and that I had to respond. Yeah, very good. Well, I, I unfortunately, yeah, we're out of time. Uh, wow, what a powerful story. Uh, Debbie, uh, where can people get a hold of uh, you and your books and, and uh, Renewal Ministries? Um, they can get a hold of me on um, renewalministries.net or um, another ministry that I lead is called Be Love Revolution. Be Love Revolution, and that's a ministry to high school and young adult women, and they can look on my website um, to see what we're doing and can contact me through the website and just, just learn more about the ministry. And, um, yeah, I'd love to talk to people, and, um, and I'd love to pray for anyone who is in a friendship and a relationship with a Jewish person is trying to evangelize them. And the, the, the young woman who gave me the Bible, she became a nun and wow. gave me her Bible to take with me as I travel and speak. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. Of course. Uh, Thanks for having me. That's uh, Debbie Herbeck, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, man, it's already time to shut down the dojo lights. What a compelling story. Uh, coming up next, High Intensity Catholic Talk Radio coming at you with the Terry and Jesse Show, the Dynamic Duo. Uh, and it's time for me to turn off the dojo lights here and shut down the Midwest Command Center, at least temporarily. I'll see you next week, Monday. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, 
you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.